You know, when I was growing up, I was taught that being an American meant that anyone can be an American. It's as though our soil just has this magical property to it where once you touch it, you're automatically in the club. You're no different from the people who built this country, whose ancestors sacrificed and bled to make this country. The fact that you took the time to show up is just such a kind and enriching gesture that you're just automatically in the club. We even, we use the same word to describe you as we do ourselves. We're all just American. We build the civilization. That's our half. And then your half is just you show up, you have a great time, and we'll call it all equal. And that sounded like a really good idea for a very long time. But now that I've developed some patina, I look at what happens when you introduce populations of Venezuelans to Aurora, Colorado. I look at Minneapolis when you introduce populations of Somalians. And I look at Springfield, Ohio when you introduce populations of Haitians. And I wondered to myself, how arrogant is it to think that we could change human nature? What kind of hubris is that? You know, I can't help but think back to when a wise man once said, import the third world, become the third world. And there's a lot of talk about what that actually is. The third world gets thrown around a lot. So I want to talk about that because I know that there are differences. So we're going to talk about what's happening in these towns, why it's happening, some of the biggest lies about immigration, some Haitian history, some Haitian background info, uh, what role religion and Christianity play in all of this, if it's Christian to refuse these people entry into our country because I'm told that it's freaking not, and most importantly, what the third world really is and why, generally speaking, and what that's all going to look like and mean for our future. I think this will sharpen our understandings of the direction in which we're headed. I want to give you a better picture of what's going on. And whatever that is, it's moving a lot faster by the year. I'm surprised. Even I now have memories of when it wasn't like this. When I go back home to Michigan, I see how things have changed. I'm like, okay, wait a second. Even now, where I live in Texas versus three years ago when I moved here, I'm like, wait a second. Things are changing. They're accelerating. And people are noticing even more. And there was already a lot of anxiety in the 90s and in the 2000s about the open border because Americans were starting to see and really feel the effects of more and more immigration. Even California, God bless them. They passed two propositions in the 1990s fighting back against this. I have very low tolerance for the whole like anti-California. <laughs> you voted for that. No, they did not, dude. Millions of people were imported to their state to solidify permanent leftist control. The same thing is now happening to you at a national scale. So please have some sympathy. But yeah, people were really starting to notice these things in the 90s and in the 2000s. And resultantly, there was a lot of money that went into quelling those anxieties with talk about natural conservatives, family values, deeply religious, think of the food. And that bought some time when it was like Mexicans, but now we have Haitians. And for some reason, which I, I can't quite put my finger on, it's just not really hitting the same. And it just had to be the Haitians. It could not really have been any other group. I mean, it really is perfect. I tweeted this out. And the reason it's such a great issue and politically such a great happening is because it completes the evolution of the last 10 years of this discussion, or at least it brings it to its end game. It completes the framing of the 2024 election as a question of America or the third world. It ties a very nice bow on it. And I can't think of any other way besides literally like what is happening to the country and to our base to get people to understand the distinction between legal and illegal with immigrants doesn't actually matter. Um, that's why I wrote in the tweet, it had to be the Haitians. It's so perfect. We keep being awarded just miracle after miracle. It's really just an exciting time. But yeah, if you get like a thousand Haitians dropped off in your town, does it really make a difference if that's done with or without the official blessing of the state? And come to think of it, some might even say that the biggest recognizer of the lack of difference between legal and illegal immigration is the state itself, since it doesn't even enforce its own immigration laws. So the end result is just like total open borders either way. But the good news is that just declaring a bunch of people legal immigrants through some government fiat, like the TPS programs, that means we can just as easily reverse it. It's all on paper. None of it's real anyway. So there are ways to fix this and we have to fix it. If you want a future in this country, then you have to go after this because it's the only way that you have a shot at winning. Immigration is their power. None of your victories will last if you do not challenge immigration. You didn't lose the argument. They just changed the composition of its participants. Nobody who is not prioritizing immigration is of any use in the final tally. But just a little bit of housekeeping before we continue. I must light the beacon. I must alert all patriots that we are rallying at Penn State this upcoming Monday, September 30th, as I continue my own personal enter the dragon against the agents of the libtard menace, this time against popular liberal streamer Destiny, as we debate the question of 
Trump versus Kamala for president in 2024. We've done these the past couple falls. They're always a lot of fun. And so uh, I hope to see you there. I'll leave a link in the description to the event page if you want to check it out. Um, it's going to be epic. We're going to declare total patriot victory. So uh, yes, do that. But anyway, legal versus illegal doesn't really matter. Doesn't really make a difference, to be honest with you. We don't need immigrants. Oh, well, you have to have immigration. Where is that written? Are, are we just like suffocating to death? We're just unable to build a civilization because as Americans, we by ourselves are insufficient. We just need these other people to come in, show us how it's done. Are you sure about that? I think it's the opposite. One of us is wrong. Oh, but, but what about my birth rates? Not now. Separate discussion. Perhaps we will address soon. I guess the basic summary is that people will have children when they believe that their society has a future. Once you have to find a way to directly compel people to have children, it's like pretty much over. I mean, if anything, literally offering them money for it just makes the situation even more bleak and more undesirable. Like, why would people want to plant roots in a country that they feel is no longer theirs? You think when parents take their first child to Disney World or to a shopping mall? Do you think that's a scene that inspires them to want to have more children? Is that something that makes them feel secure in their sovereignty as Americans and in their right to manifest destiny? I probably, I wouldn't bet on it. Um, but yeah, with legal versus illegal, if like a dozen South Koreans or Swedes were like Scooby-Doo style sneaking across the border in a box, you know, like their toes sticking out, am I going to pretend that's more problematic than like a dozen Haitians coming in legally, even half a dozen Haitians coming in legally through some program started by the Brandon administration? No, because I'm an honest person, <laughs> but it's illegal. It's okay. So suddenly what we value the opinion of the government, which obviously has betrayed us, especially with this issue. I'm supposed to accept these people flooding into my country because it has like what the blessing of the state, which which I know hates me. Okay. If you have no problems with legal immigration, that means that you're trusting the government, which is supposed to enforce laws to handle immigration in a way that will benefit you as an American legally. Of course, legal immigration is almost always a scam, which we will discuss more in just a second. Um, but I believe that Americans are the highest quality people on the planet. And because I know this, I'm insulted by the prospect that we like just somehow really need these other people to flood into the country and help us figure it out. Um, no, actually, you guys should be kissing our feet. So we will come back to that. But I'm sure you guys have all seen what's been going on with the uh, the new American Heartland, what the locals are reporting, despite the efforts of the mainstream media to cover all of this up or to ignore it. You've got car accidents from uninsured illegal drivers. You've got illegal Haitians killing 71 year olds while driving, facing no charges. You've got an 11 year old boy, Aiden Clark, being murdered murdered by a Haitian, his dad coming out and making a statement saying that he wishes he were instead murdered by a white person so that this isn't made into some big issue about Haitians, which would be like a normal person's reaction when their 11 year old son is killed in Ohio by a Haitian. You'd kind of wonder like why that's going on. Uh, but it also makes you wonder why anytime something like this happens, these poor parents always have to come out and say the same line about how we can't make this into a big issue. You know, it may have something to do with the grieving relatives of white people killed by non-white people receiving visitation and instruction from the Department of Justice's Community Relations Service, which is literally trained to use moral guilt to coerce these people into making these statements to local news, to whatever. When enrichment needs a publicist, right? It's such a strength that you need media training to communicate it properly. It is like this Lovecraftian strength, which would just melt the mind of the average person upon attempted perception. You actually, you need special media training to communicate it safely, just how enriching and strengthening this all is. Otherwise, you will turn the minds of the public into mashed potatoes. But yeah, no matter what they try to do, the Springfield stuff is actually keeping its legs because the more that the DNC hacks and the media hacks try to like freaking debunk it, the more light it shines on how actually bad it is in Springfield and everywhere else. And you look at these places, you see how hollowed out they are and how the local leadership even is like annoyed that the residents would dare ask them for some answers or for some accountability. And it's happening all over. It's Ohio, it's New York, it's Alabama, Pennsylvania, Charleroi, Pennsylvania. It's a town of like 4,000 people. They just got 2,000 Haitians uh, shipped right to their doorstep. It's happening all over the place. And of course, what does it do? It just, they keep it moving, right? I saw some Ohio Haitian community leader, which God help, why is that a phrase? The Ohio Haitian community and its leader, like who voted for, who asked for this? We're not so democratic anymore, are we? Uh, but yeah, this guy was echoing the sentiment that's been taught to everyone here and to the world at large to create a very not mutually beneficial relationship that America should be an open country for everybody. And this is how they all think. You can't change that. You can't argue your way out of that. And I mean, like, can you really blame them? They just want what is going to benefit them. 
Who can fault them for that? But likewise, we won't be faulted for wanting what's best for us, which just so happens to have you not here. And yeah, we get to make that call because it's our country and that's how the world works. So, sorry. Oh, well, they, they just want a better life. That's the American dream. What is a better life, though? Do you think that means the same thing for everyone? No, the better life is just getting free stuff. That is their dream. Leeching off the labor of American patriots is all they've ever wanted. A better life? A hundred immigrants come here. Okay, maybe I buy that. But tens of millions? Why couldn't you just apply all that you have to offer in your own countries? Why did you have to come here? Free stuff. Simple as. They literally admit that. They get upset when they don't get the free stuff that they thought they were going to get when they arrive in our cities. You've seen the interviews. And even that aside, you don't even actually have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, you don't owe them anything. Hey, get that through your head. You don't owe them a thing. A single thing. Not even one thing. It's not our fault. It's not our problem. It's not our responsibility. The world is a mess. The world has always been a mess. Our job is to create and preserve a civilization for ourselves and prevent the chaos of the world from seeping into it and, and seeping into it and making it like itself, like the average state of the world, which is exactly what it does. It's in its nature to do so. There's not another way. The world is not artificially below us. We are miraculously above it. We will regress to the mean. We are the exception. That's what American exceptionalism means. If you keep adding red 40 to water, does it stop being red 40? No, but the water stops being water. And the more red 40 you add, the less like water your beverage will be. And it's okay to say that, by the way, you get to. Your ancestors earned you that right, and no one can actually tell you otherwise. Oh, well, but we need them because we need people to do the tough jobs because, well, that's how we take down China. What? Merit-based immigration, don't make me laugh. Merit-based immigration is a lie, by the way. We really should do a whole separate video on that, going through that, the lie of merit-based immigration. We don't even have that right now. But people say, well, we should go back to that, as if it's meaningfully different, as if it actually solves the problem, as if it's not just open borders by a different name. To summarize here briefly, it is so profoundly disingenuous to advocate for merit-based immigration internationally if we don't have merit domestically. I hate this lie. You know, people say, hey, we're gonna open up the floodgates to a million people every year, but it's based on merit because we need merit. Well, at the same time, nothing is being done to dismantle the systems which systematically take away opportunities from those who are actually qualified. You know how everything that happens is always meant to screw you over. You know how that's kind of a theme? Well, that's that's here too, actually. Notice how the end result is the same. Americans get screwed in the name of diversity. If it's screwing you over domestically, well then, you know, we don't really need merit. If it's screwing you over internationally by letting in one million people every year, well then, yeah, you should definitely support that because at least it's merit-based, right? That's cringe. This is merit-based, so it's epic. We have plenty of merit in this country. We have guys in middle America scoring 1560 on their SATs only to be rejected from every Ivy League or otherwise elite university denied grants, scholarships. Don't talk to me about merit because what happens when you start to get millions of these merit-based immigrants, they form ethnic lobbies. They want more immigration. They want to bring their families over. They only hire each other. Anyone who works in tech will tell you that. Every hiring discrimination lawsuit against Indians has been successful because they only hire other Indians. And funny enough, uh, the merit... It's not quite there. They forge transcripts, they lie about qualifications, whatever they have to do. Again, the whole thing is a scam. We built the modern world, we don't need any help. We got it under control, I promise. And you know, if we don't have it under control, it's because we're being made passengers to our own destiny. Give us a sec, we'll figure it out, okay? And there's every excuse for it. Maybe some sound more appealing to us than others. The result is the same, which is that we are getting screwed. Some say equality is good, some say merit's good. We're, we're all getting screwed. That's the end result. Because people have been made to feel as though they have no agency. They don't know who to hold accountable, so over time it becomes less that people are doing something and more that things just happen. Things just happen. Nobody is doing this, it just happens. And it's low status to think otherwise. That's what crazy people do. And crazy people are incompatible with our democracy. They're threats to our democracy. Okay, uh, well, four years ago, there were zero federal programs to illegally transport Haitian migrants to the US. This was a decision. Somebody went to work, probably with your money, uh, they were paid, and they did this. Well, Erm, it's called asylum, actually. Asylum, give me a break. A refugee is just an invader with a lawyer. A refugee is just an invader who's learned the passphrase. Just say that, just say it's like 10 words. Yeah, yeah, you say this, they think it means you get to enter their country. 
I don't know. It just works. Just say it. And they do. But of course, Harris launched multiple programs, including flights to mass import Haitian illegals with no public consent. We're like 500,000 and counting. And now you've got Haitian charities filing criminal charges against Trump and J.D. Vance over some of their more interesting observations. Uh, the organization is called the Haitian Bridge Alliance, and their About Us page claims that immigration is a black issue. Okay, so yeah, Trump is going to send the DOJ and the IRS after these people in January. Day one, these are the people responsible for the invasion. They have to be held accountable. It's as simple as that. You know, we talk about dismantling their patronage networks. That's it. Like, throw sand in the gears. Bury them with lawsuits, investigations, audits, whatever it takes. There is this disgusting network of NGOs, politicians, businessmen, churches. They all coordinate to bring these people from everywhere in the world into our country. And they receive billions of dollars in government grants to literally organize these people and facilitate their invasion of our country. And then once they're here, they all just begin collecting their free stuff, which you pay for, generously granted to them by the American taxpayer, you, who, if put to a vote, would send them all back overnight. But of course, you know, we just have to shut up and accept this, I guess. Otherwise, we're like evil and racist. Um, like with the case of the Haitians in Ohio, they're eligible for the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is SNAP, food stamps, EBT cards. That's what that is. They're getting uh, refugee cash assistance. They get SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. They get refugee rent assistance. They get to skip credit checks for uh, housing applications. They get eight months of free health insurance. They get to sign up for Medicaid after that. Five years of support from the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which includes daycare for their children. They can get driver's licenses. That's not even mentioning all the private incentives that people are laundering money into for these people. Not even mentioning the amount of Russian and Chinese money that goes into these NGOs, which are involved in literally, again, importing Haitians to these towns in the middle of our country, among many other things, among many other types of people. And of course, no public official has offered any explanation for why this has to happen, why these programs were launched, what benefit they're supposed to bring to Americans. And it's because they just hate you. There's no benefit. There's, it's no longer a conspiracy theory. It's just good, actually. That's the cycle. The cycle is, it's not happening. That's a conspiracy theory. It is happening, but it's actually good that it's happening. It's, that's the celebration parallax, right? When I view the object, it's bad, and I'm wrong. When you view the same object, it's good, actually, and you're right. That's what it is. Is You know, someone famously said, you can call yourself a leftist and get away with not embracing socialist economic policies. You're not going to get kicked out of the club for that by your peers. But there's no scenario where you can get away with not worshiping diversity, not worshiping the LGBT stuff, not supporting replacement migration. Therefore, that is what leftism is. It is defined like anything else by what it can never exclude. And as we'll discuss, we evaluate things based on what happens, not based on what is said, not based on words. And what happens is that that is what leftism is as a political project. And our political project is stopping them from ruining everything, which means we have to dismantle their power, which means we have to go after immigration, which means we have to send them all back, also known as remigration. Just go back. You were just, you were just there. Some of you a year ago, some of you 30 years ago. You just you got to go back. And thank God this is where the conversation is heading because... We won't survive without it. And notice Trump is still the only one talking about this. It's okay. We're winning. We're going to keep going. Not a problem. Um, but I've been told that this is mean. I've been told that we have to have sympathy, John. Haiti is 93% Christian, John. You don't want him here? It's a great question. Maybe they'd be 100% Christian if they didn't keep killing all the missionaries who go there. You know, they always end up getting murdered somehow. But before I award my charity, I have to ask, what are they fleeing from exactly? What are they running away from if not the fruits of their own sovereignty? They are fleeing from what happens when they're left to themselves to function. Okay, so what, you get to be a refugee if you're just, like, incapable of cultivating a civilization? Which, ironically, people from that, uh, that's, like, the last person you would want. War-torn, you know, natural disaster causing famine. Like, okay, I get it, but you just can't get it together when you're left to yourselves. Like, I don't know, maybe we should think twice about that. Maybe those are literally the last people in the world that we would want moving here. And it's funny because the official reason for why Haiti is the way that it is, according to Haiti, is that 200 years ago, the French sent them an invoice for killing all their people and stealing all their stuff, and then Haiti didn't even pay that invoice, but still, it's why they're so poor. Now, if I were a cold-hearted cynic, I might invoke that we've given Haiti $20 billion in aid in the last 60 years, and if they had to pay until 1947, I mean, that seems kind of unimportant considering that, say, around that same time, we turned Hiroshima into a parking lot, but have you seen it recently? It looks like a nice place to visit, but I don't know. That sounds mean and uncharitable to my fellow global citizens, but uh, maybe for some more background for those with the misfortune of being ignorant to the rich history of the Haitian people, uh, essentially, they're 
They're descended from West African slaves who were brought over there hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And then they led a revolution against the French just a few hundred years ago, which began with them making sacrifices to demons in the Haitian wilderness upon some mountain or some hill. And then uh, there was like this voodoo ritual. And then they came down from the hill and started killing Frenchmen, literally just killing all, killing all the white people, even the ones who they openly admitted and acknowledged to their faces were always very kind to them and shared their attitudes towards racial equality. They just hung them anyway, just to get back at the French. And there's a lot of imagery of this, which has always been passed around leftist circles. It's been seen as very inspiring to black nationalists, to revolutionaries, in the same way that these people get excited about John Brown or General Sherman, any sort of historical narrative they can use to explain their hatred towards normal white people, like they'll just run with. It's like when people talk about the Haitian revolution, this is what they mean. They mean to translate that happening into contemporary America. Everything that these people like gloat over is just patriot death and patriot suffering. This vague feeling that, you know, we just have it coming, even if they can't explain why. I just remember too the other day that Kanye West used to go on and on about how awesome the Haitian revolution was. Sneeko does this too. That's why he's joining the left once again in mourning the austere religious scholar who was just put to death for stabbing a woman to death 43 times. Um, but it's actually the same thing as a lynching, I guess. Who could have predicted this? Who could have predicted the trajectories of these based in name only figures? Me and literally everyone else who isn't genuinely low IQ or a spiritual leftist. But with these global citizens, with these new neighbors, people are reporting more and more that these people from all over the world are engaging in behaviors that we'll say are just um, maybe not compatible with American culture and American sensibilities. What Americans like to see when they look outside. And you know, the fear of strange occult rituals being practiced in secret, perhaps in the cover of night by your own community, that is one of the most authentically American superstitions out there. Nathaniel Hawthorne was writing about this 200 years ago. People online write about this all the time today. It's a motif in pretty much every aspect of our society. So in a way, it's culturally insensitive of you to be upset with us for being culturally insensitive to you and assuming you're practicing witchcraft. That's just kind of like what we do over here. You can't really have your apple pie without it. You know, that's why it's funny that it has to be Haitians given, um, you know, their history of interesting cultural performances. Again, had to be the Haitians perfectly lined up. There's no escape from this. You know, it's big cities, small towns, no matter where you are, there's no scenario where these people just leave you alone. You can't just be left alone. They will be imported to your town. Your tax dollars will pay for it locally, nationally. You will subsidize their existence and their multiplication. There's no way around this. The only way is through. And you're in decent company. I mean, there's a well-established history of tyrants establishing and consolidating power by simply importing foreigners who are dependent upon them for a higher quality of life, a higher standard of living, because tyrants know that when push comes to shove, foreigners will remain loyal to them more than anything else. Anywhere on the map where you can land a dart, you can find some version of this taking place at some point in history, certainly many times in Europe, but they can do that with a lot of different groups of people, as they have been for a very long time, uh, but they really like Haitians because Haitians require a lot of Christian patience to deal with, I suppose we'll say. Haiti really is a motif, isn't it? It's like this playground for the satanic anti-white NGO conglomerate. It has been for a very long time. The point being, at the end of the day, it's not complicated. They're bringing in Haitians because they want to punish you. They want to displace you politically, economically, demographically. They don't like you. They hate you because you're a husky white boy, because you are among the forgotten gamers of America. Like there's no argument anymore. No like muh, enrichment, no economic argument like they had maybe for other groups of people. It's just a big middle finger. It's refusing to let you complain about it, be that nationally or even at local city hall meetings. Just a big F you, rubbing your nose in it, literally celebrating. I mean, tweets going viral, taunting. I want every Midwest town to have an influx of Haitians. No, uh, no thank you, you can't do it. No, you can't, I disagree with that. And the base is finally comfortable pushing back against this, this is good. This is what the early stages of victory look like when we say that things had to get worse before they get better. This is to what that is referring, it had to be Haitians. It had to be stories of Haitians eating pets. It had to be AI boomer memes of dogs supporting Trump, which spread like wildfire all over Facebook. It had to be this way. It is all perfect, don't you see? And the cat thing is so funny because you have the most conservative people in the world 
trying to launder nativist sentiment into baby boomers through like these AI memes of cute pets and cats all supporting Trump. It really is everything coming full circle. What another nice bow we get in 2024. What is the internet really for in the first place if not funny cat pictures and racism? Like everything is falling right back into place. Right on schedule. It's the perfect framing of 2024. It had to be the Haitians. I remember what I felt like in 2016. I remember what I felt like in 2020. And I know what I feel like now. And I feel good. Every campaign needs to have a thesis. It has to have an essence about itself that it can sell to people because it resonates with them. In 2016, it was the American people versus the establishment. And this worked out pretty well. In 2020, it seemed to struggle to identify itself. It was like, uh, I don't know, America versus the economic theory of socialism, I guess. And fortification aside, it obviously, you know, didn't work out so well. And I was one of the biggest critics of Trump at that time during 2020 because I thought he was making mistakes. And I stand by everything I said at that time. And at that time, people were accusing me of disloyalty, but I was right. He was actually making big mistakes along the way, um, the way that people pretend he is now for social media engagement. But now we have it. It's not about economics. It is about identity, who we are what our future looks like. The economics don't really matter the way people think. Leftist economics are not even meant to be economics. They are meant to be a pretext to inflict pain upon their enemies. Okay, so what does that pain look like then? That's what people need to consider. That's what resonates with people. It's not enough to say, well, you know, the economic system of socialism is it's just mismanaged and it's generally not a good idea. Okay, how does that resonate with anyone? When people think Marxism or socialism, they think third world. They think slums and garbage and overcrowding and inflation. They don't think like, Scandinavia, you know, even if that's where people want to keep the conversation focused uh, because the truth makes them uncomfortable. You know, I look at socialist Norway, I look at socialist whatever third world country, I think I might know why they look a little bit different. I don't know if it's exactly the economic, uh, whatever. So in 2020, okay, socialism, 2016 was establishment versus anti-establishment, 2024, perfectly becoming America versus the third world. That is our fork in the road. That's the question of this election. Do we want to be America or do we want to be the third world with, yes, socialism? But more importantly, vagrancy, mass immigration, overcrowding, inflation, crime, all as tentacles of this one disgusting thing into which our country is rapidly devolving. And now people hear Trump say the word socialism and they think, well, that's just a repeat of 2020. It's the same thing. No, it is becoming exactly what it needs to be. It is fulfilling the spirit of 2016. It's always been about identity. It's always been about borders. And Trump has made that the center of his campaign in 2024. And he's the only Republican to do it. He's the only Republican to talk about mass deportations, which have to happen. He's leaning into it. And again, as someone who remembers 2016 very well, which I know is not maybe the most impressive thing in the world, but you would be surprised how many arrows I have to take every week from autistic 15-year-olds who uh, became politically aware sometime during COVID or in many cases even after. But as someone who remembers 2016, <laughs> someone who remembers 2016, and, and who knows all the big players from that time who were supporting Trump, because remember, nobody in the mainstream was supporting Trump. It was Milo, who was like mainstream adjacent, Alex Jones, the Twitter accounts. Um, there were no like big media figures getting behind this guy. But everyone who was paying attention in 2016, myself included, will tell you that this is better than what would have ever been expected. It's really, it's an exciting time. The madman's actually gonna do it. Trump is visiting these places. He's talking about the Haitians. It had to be the Haitians. The base, whose support we need, yes, they needed an opportunity to realize these things, to wake up, so to speak, and it's been given to them. I mean, I've said it a million times. As our decline continues, people's anxieties are going to give them permission to entertain things which otherwise would have been off the table, whether that's because they're too taboo, too low status, doesn't matter. Now people understand what makes America, America. How different we are when compared to the rest of the world, the third world. And with the third world, you must understand that that is the natural state of things. That is the third world. It's natural. It's not a matter of being dealt a few bad hands or being exploited. You give them trillions of dollars to overcome those factors, and all that happens is the rapid creation of more mouths demanding that you feed them too. I'll put it this way. I've seen what Europeans do when they arrive at an ice desert or a giant rock in the middle of an ocean where everything there is trying to kill them, and I've seen what Haitians do when they arrive in Springfield, Ohio. Civilization is not the natural state of things. It is cultivated. We cultivate it. That is what a culture is. The natural state of mankind is that. We have achieved this, but it is not natural. It ceases to exist if not maintained. We look at our civilization and we take it for granted. We think that everyone else is living worse off and it must somehow be because of us that they're not up to our standard. It's the opposite. They are not worse off. We are just way better off. And explaining why this is the case without being mean is a multi-billion dollar industry, of course, probably even more actually. But nonetheless, it remains a fact that the only thing which has ever brought what might resemble 
civilization to those corners of the globe, something that you might recognize as, okay, I would like to live there, that's been European influence. And when the Europeans left because they were being mean and they were exploiting them, things regressed pretty much right back to the mean. Your brain sees these images in these videos and it thinks, ah, well, something's wrong here to you, yes. But this is how things have always been for all of history. This is normal. You see people eating mud, living in buildings falling apart. Wow, oh, no, 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 no. The buildings aren't supposed to look like that. What's wrong here? What do you mean? What is a building supposed to look like? In your opinion, what do you think a building is supposed to look like? Who decides that? More importantly, who are you counting on to maintain that? Who enforces that standard? Who makes sure that the building stays looking that way? You go in and you provide infrastructure to populations that have never had it, and you feel bad when it goes to ruin. They're not sad about it. Their feelings aren't hurt. It just literally, it does not occur to them. They don't know any better. You, in your mind, you feel a certain way about it because in your civilization, things are done a certain way, and you think everyone else, they just can't quite get it together, and it makes you so sad to think about what if things just are that way, though? What if you're the exception? You think if you just provide money and an instruction manual, then they'll just be like, oh, okay, that was it. Okay, we get it now. Sorry. No. What even is money? What does money even do? Money is just power. It lets you do more of what you want, right? Therefore, thinking that money solves problems is a liberal idea. Like, we're all good. We just need the chance to be good. Everyone's the same. It's only income and opportunity, which are different and unequal. Money is not a moral compass. All it can do is make people more of what they are. It amplifies the characteristics of its host. He who is faithful with little is faithful with much. You've never seen money change someone. They might be working really hard. They're down on their luck, and then they come across some money. They come by some money, and then it helps them out. They keep moving in the, the direction they were already going going, but now it's a bit easier, but you've never seen someone be like a total loser and then they come across some money and then they stop being a loser. Like look at lottery winners, how they so often end up broke again within like five years. So if you give money to people who enjoy being civilized, they'll probably use it to build some nice places to live or some places to visit. Uh, but if you give it to people who are not civilized, then they will probably use it in some not so civilized ways. Liberals think that money, education, opportunity, resources, that these things are like instruments for human improvement. And if everyone just had these things, then we could all just live in Imagine by John Lennon and we could do trust falls and sing Kumbaya. But none of the policies inspired by this thinking have ever worked at any point ever, in any place. It's delusional. It is misaligned with reality. Chicken and egg, right? Higher IQ people, just like higher IQ countries, tend to accumulate money, resources, education. They tend to create opportunities to continue that cycle for themselves and for their families. Libtards will see that and they get it backwards. They think that it's those things which create the high IQ, which create the person, basically. And so if everyone had those things, then everything would be fine. But that's not the case. Look at the rest of the world. Japan, Singapore. South Korea. These are among the wealthiest countries in the world. Why? What do they even do? When's the last time you've seen like made in South Korea stamped on something? Do you have any idea what, what sustains the South Korean economy? Did you think it was just K-pop? That was the chief export. I don't believe in economics. I believe in history and not being an idiot. And the history of economies basically shows that, very simply um, that production equals prosperity. And production requires very complex systems being executed correctly every time on schedule in, indefinitely, in perpetuity. Whether you're manufacturing ships, mining iron, being Samsung, like you need to be able to do that. And South Korea can do that because they're pretty smart. But surely if we just gave more resources and opportunity to other countries, then they would be just like them, right? They'd be just like South Korea. Well, if you actually look at the data on these things, uh, approximately 70% of the variation in the wealth of nations can be explained by IQ alone, by the average IQ of the population. So if you're looking at 100 countries, they're all at different levels, and you're like, okay, well, how do I make sense of all of this variation? Well, about 70% of that variance can be explained solely by IQ, by intelligence. People say IQ is not a real thing. Sure, we made it up. You can't find it on the periodic table. But for some reason, whatever it is, keeps showing up when predicting things that are very important. IQ doesn't exist. It's not real. But for some reason, we find that people who test at higher levels of that fake made up number tend to have all sorts of better life outcomes, higher income, longevity, lower chance of criminal activity, all sorts of things. So whatever it's testing for apparently does mean something. Even if people like to tell themselves they can't be reduced to a freaking number. Sure you can. Have you ever had a birthday before? Like, it's not that deep. We made up a number. We're using it to, <laughs> we're using it to define you cry about it. Take the test, get your number, either use it to become irrationally self-confident for the rest of your life or write the whole thing off together. 
you choose your path, you know? It's like we all have one to choose. But yeah, you know, you take any basic stats class and they show you, you can take the correlation between two variables, square it, and that figure will give you the amount of variance in the first variable's data that can be explained by the second variable's data. It tells you what proportion of the data uh, for the dependent variable can be explained by the variance in the independent variable. Um, did you know that correlation does not equal causation? Thank you. Yes. Okay. So if I'm looking at the data for like how many Nicolas Cage movies uh, are put out every year and how that correlates with how many people drown in swimming pools every year, which I'm pretty sure has a correlation of like 0.67 or something. It's one of those weird examples I remember talking about seven years ago. Like, yeah, those things are very different. Probably don't want to think too hard about that correlation. But if a variable like IQ is implied to have certain outcomes that we are measuring for, something like wealth, well, then that's a little bit different, isn't it? It's like not everything, but it's not nothing. If it seems like one thing may cause another, then if we find a correlation between those two things, it's not exactly the same as a correlation between two things that obviously have nothing to do with each other. So average IQ is important, but what's really important is whether there are enough high IQ, high energy people to facilitate the conditions for civilization to occur, uh, even if to a degree that may be unsatisfying to our standard of what that should look like and to what extent these people are held back from doing this. Haiti, for example, their average IQ is below 70 and they have largely massacred this type of person and their living conditions reflect that uh, decision of theirs. But there are other countries which, you know, we might place into the same category or something close, and these countries are not as low IQ, and they do allow for capable people to do this. But the problem is that when this goes on for long enough, typically the high IQ people who keep the lights on, they keep the water running, those guys start to head into retirement, and then the replacements are like DEI hires who, of course, were, you know, being unfairly kept out of these occupations for no reason, and so they're placed into them as a matter of policy. And then for whatever reason, things just don't quite work out how they used to. And I don't mean to be culturally insensitive in using this word, but what tends to happen over time is that even when these societies can function for a period, maybe even a long period, by allowing competent people to maintain civilization, eventually they just cannibalize themselves. Eventually things are taken for granted, things are made more equal, resources are more justly distributed, eventually water finds its own level, and society becomes an expression of its average person. Maybe the phrase regress to the mean is useful here. And it's sort of ironic, I guess, that lower IQ people people um, are less able to understand why it's necessary for more capable people to be in charge of these things. They think that they're just being taken advantage of for no reason at all. And so they use their power to take jobs, money, control, whatever, away from more capable people. And then all of a sudden, their living conditions are a lot worse. Look at Haiti under French rule versus now. Look at Zimbabwe under English rule, Rhodesia versus now, South Africa, etc. I mean, these things have ways of repeating themselves. And it's not to let high IQ people off the hook, by the way. High IQ people actually really struggle with a theory of mind for everyone else. Intelligence Intelligent people have no idea how unintelligent people experience the world. How many things which intelligent people are constantly keeping track of, which just simply never occur to unintelligent people or are much harder for them to keep track of, leading to, uh, we'll say, less than satisfactory results. And intelligence is not the be-all, end-all. You have to have more than that for this all to work. You have to be able to kind of think outside of the box, so to speak. It's not enough to understand like what's in the box, how it works, pick that all up very quickly. There's something else that goes beyond that, which you have to have. Asians, for example, famously very intelligent, generally speaking, but they don't necessarily have that trait going for them so much as they do just being intelligent. Hence the saying, uh, Asians don't innovate, they iterate, which does have some truth to it. If you're looking like purely at innovation, Northwestern Europe remains king. It's not even somewhat close, but yeah, people who um, can be intelligent can also be very delusional. As maybe counterintuitive as that sounds, it is true. I mean, there's a reason that the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence exists, right? You know, Kopfid was a good example of that. So it's not the be all end all IQ, raw intelligence, but it certainly is very important. And the fact that something like IQ is not a perfect measure of everything does not mean that like it doesn't mean anything and we can just discount it and pretend it's like completely useless. You know, just throw it out the window because surely being low IQ isn't any different, right? And it's like, eh. Since being high IQ can fail, it must all be the same. Like, no, there are multiple factors to consider, multiple variables to evaluate. And precisely because we are high IQ, we can do that. So it's fine. Um, but yeah, it's not a matter of just getting lucky. None of this is an accident. Actions speak louder than words. People are what they do. And what is an environment, if not evidence of what humans do or don't do over a prolonged period of time? 
Ice deserts can be nice places to live, and tropical islands can be hell holes. There are lots of fascinating things in the world. But the core of left-wing thought is that things like, you know, education, money, opportunity, resources, etc., can all be used as instruments for human improvement. And the only problem with that is, like we said, it's never worked. Um, but we would literally rather believe that and continue spending trillions of dollars, which we do, trillions with a T, than consider the possibility that the opposite is true, that these things just are used to amplify what people are, who people are, make parts of them more extreme, more obvious, but uh, very rarely do these ever actually change, like who people are fundamentally. And that's a tough pill to swallow, but such is life. And people on the right even struggle with this. You know, they think that it's enough to use religion as a qualifier. Uh, we need to exercise our second order thinking, patriots. What percentage of congressmen have been self-identified Christian in the last 60 years? It's about the same overall um, now as it was in the 60s. Vast, vast majority Christian, but now there are fewer wasps and more Catholics than Jews, as go the the trends for ruling class composition during the same time. And if things continue, then you'll see the ascendant Brahmin faction and all sorts of new and fun things will happen. You thought the last 60 years were bad. Oh man, things are going to get, we're, we're really going to get killed. But yes, like we said, Haiti is something like 93% Christian. So of course the reason Haiti is the way that it is, is simply because of a very disruptive 7% of the population. 7 percenters causing problems, nothing new under the sun, I suppose. But dare I ask for the sake of entertaining you personally right now, if someone says, Haiti is a Christian country. Of those two words, which will tell you more about the behavior of the people living there? Which one? Think. Be smart. I think a lot of Christians struggle with this. Don't spurg out. Listen to my words. The polling says they're looking good on immigration, but Catholics, I don't know what it is. I do. I cannot tell you how many Catholics have policed my tone on immigration. For what it's worth, they've all been women, but still, literally getting on the mic during the Q&A at my events. Um, how can you claim to be Catholic if you're against these people coming to the country? Why should it even matter if we're all made in the image of God? There is no Greek nor Jew. Look, sweetheart, ignoring that there have been plenty of popes and saints who have expressed similar sentiments to my own in their writings, can we please maybe just like think about this a little bit on paper? Haiti, for example, 52% Catholic. That's almost twice as Catholic as America. Does that mean that Haiti is going to be beneficial to us? It's going to be a good example. Is this even possible to believe? Is simply being Christian sufficient? Is wearing that label, is identifying as Christian sufficient? Obviously not, which if you're a Christian, you know the biggest problem is that people use that label for the wrong reason, for vanity. They misunderstand it. They disgrace it. But when suddenly now I'm just like, I don't know, pleading for the country to stop committing suicide by becoming the third world because of importation. And I don't know if you've ever been to a third world country, but despite large self-identification as Christian, they're not exactly breeding grounds for the cardinal virtues. But now when I bring this up, I get people telling me, uh, well, actually, now in this instance, everything is fine. We can all be Christians, actually, as if that word just means the same thing to everyone who uses it, to every culture who uses it. What happens if that word has a different meaning to different people? Not that the true meaning of the word changes, by the way, but when different people use that word to them, what if it means something different? Have you ever looked into the residual cultural influences from the Aztecs on Mexican Catholicism? Or what about the voodoo influences on Haitian Catholicism? Or how Nigerian bishops are always having to emphasize the repudiation of voodoo? Voodoo practices, it's not sufficient to use labels to guide our decisions. Maybe even more so when there's a language barrier. Behavior, actions, these all speak louder than words. Even if those words are really nice and we want to believe them, and hopefully they're in our language too. Fingers crossed. That'd be nice. And it's so funny because the biggest challenge to Christian anthropology is obviously that many people do not appear to be like rational actors. They behave very differently from one another. And it's certainly possible to explain this as a Christian, but most avoid it because it makes them personally uncomfortable or it offends their sensibilities. But despite this, the libtard new atheists in the 2010s who had so much momentum, they thought, they didn't care to address this at all for obvious reasons. So they settled for instead... Um, if God is real, then why does bad thing happen? That worked well for like five minutes, but then fizzled out, obviously, because we answered that question literally thousands of years ago. Wow, fresh insight, very epic. The point all being that I don't believe that these people even believe what they're saying. They just get personally offended by naughty opinions and they want to shame you with language you're familiar with into sitting up straight and being well-behaved, all while our heritage and our future just circle the drain. These groups are supposedly so religious, or so I'm told, yet according to their voting patterns, they're apparently willing to set aside those convictions to vote for the party which celebrates its defiance of them. And that's because ultimately, apparently, what matters to them is simply forwarding their ethnic interests. 61% of white Catholics support Trump. 65% of uh, Hispanic Catholics support Harris. 
I'm not casting stones here, but I'm allowed to acknowledge reality without being scolded by women. If there's one thing I believe in, it is that. People just saying the words, I am Christian, does not translate to a civilization or a civilization where virtue is cultivated and practiced. Christianity exists when it is able to impose itself as it has done historically, and it struggles to do that when there is not something resembling civilization present. People look at statistics about how many people there are, um, you know, in the country that report being Christian. And they're like, wow, the third world is freaking based. But they don't think to then look at the statistics about, I don't know, very horrible, sinful, awful behaviors occurring at very high rates in those countries, despite that, you know, supposedly high rate of self-identification. Okay, maybe it's not so simple. I don't know. But it makes people feel good to say things like, well, we're all Christians and we can all be united. Europeans are the ones who have been fighting each other for thousands of years. Okay, sure. But look at what's happening right now. European ethnic conflict is kind of like when all you know is pizza and it's all you've ever known and you really like Hungry Howie's and I really like Domino's and we're just like, what, what is this thing? How can you even live like this? You're a freak. You're an alien. I want to kill you. But then someone else comes to the dinner table and they're eating like sugar dirt or perhaps a house cat. And it's like, okay, maybe we're not so different. Maybe we actually have more in common. Let's like zoom out a little bit. Look at Ireland, Catholics and Protestants, button heads forever, to put it lightly. But then in the, in the face of mass Muslim migration, all of a sudden they're under the same flag. Interesting. What happened to assimilation? I thought they were supposed to assimilate. Yeah, that'd be nice, you know, if everything that was supposed to happen happened. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, uh, especially like 50 million people later, but assimilation's impossible. Assimilation means you can't tell the difference. If I assimilate into a CS2 team, it means I'm keeping up. I know the callouts. I know the strats. You wouldn't know me from anyone else. I'm just another guy on the team. There's nothing meaningfully or discernibly different about me. Show me an example of that in America where some group is assimilated, meaning there are no meaningful differences between how they behave, how they vote, how they do anything versus how the average American does. You cannot change culture, let alone when you bring in tens of millions of your people along with you. You know, they take pride in it, actually. They don't want to assimilate. We talked a lot about this in the uh, Why Conservatives Can't Make Culture video. Culture is not something you overthink. It's just natural. It's what people do. And frankly, how are low IQ people supposed to keep track of all the complexities that make up a culture, right? Like all of which seems so natural to you because it is natural to you because what we call culture is an outgrowth of a thousand years of Western civilization. Like it's a lot of variables to keep track of, you know, a lot of moving pieces to account for at all times, assuming they even care to do so, which again, you know, have you ever seen an example of that at large? All of our attitudes towards certain things, beliefs towards certain things, customs, heroes, history, you can't teach that. You cannot upload that to another person. It's such a ridiculous lie. And it's a lie that was sold to buy these people more time to flood the country with these people with a permanent underclass, which they can use to mobilize against normal American patriots to consolidate power forever by promising to have you subsidize the existence of them and their children. And we have to go along with this. Why? Why? Give me one answer. Compel me. We never voted for this. In fact, we voted against this multiple times and at multiple different scales. Oh, but they're starving. Yeah, dude, we like made too many of them. Their populations would never have grown to what they are now naturally. We have given trillions of dollars to these people in aid. And instead of building better civilizations, they have instead rapidly created more mouths demanding that we feed as well. We should probably stop doing that. Insanity would be repetition, right? We don't want to act like an insane person. At the end of the day, none of this is our problem. Will you have the stomach to simply not care? Can you achieve this? That's the question. Can you be emotionally disciplined? Can you be indifferent? Or are you going to be exploited and dragged along by your nose like a bull by whomever figured out how to manipulate you into letting them take advantage of you? That's the question. If you're hearing this broadcast right now, the rest of your life will be defined by whether you and your friends can be indifferent to the tears of women and foreigners. They don't care about you. They don't care about your country. They care about themselves and they care about their problems, which is fine. Nobody can fault them for that. That's only natural. But their problems, very importantly, are not our problems and they cannot become our problems any longer. And they'll recite the language that they're trained to use and they'll cry and the women will be, your wife will be so upset. You know, everyone's appealing to your sympathies, appealing to your conscience, whatever they have to do to manipulate you into the outcome that they want. I think about this a lot, you know, just bear with me. I've got a 95 pound Rhodesian Ridgeback. He's like two years old now. Recently, he's been getting very excited. And so he'll like jump up on people, not like excited in that way, but like, hi. So he'll jump up on people. And uh, so I grabbed his paws the other day and you know, I'm just like holding on to him. And he starts looking around, his eyes get all wide. He's like, uh-oh. He starts kind of like nibbling at my hands. You know, I know he's uncomfortable, but you gotta, you gotta be a little rough with these guys sometimes, especially with bigger dogs who are, you know, bred to hunt lions in South Africa. I'm a big believer in this. He's a dog. He's not gonna get his feelings hurt because I smacked him in the face. You know, he's gonna be like, oh, so true. Okay, that's what happens when I do that. Okay, based, got it, we're locked in. 
He's not a bitch. He's not going to be like, you know, sad. Okay. He's a killer, right? But he needs to understand that, yeah, if you do something bad, I'm going to smack you in the face. I'm not a social worker. I'm not going to get down to his level and explain to the animal why he can't do this and ask him to respond with I statements. No. So anyway, got his paws. Okay. He starts whining like he's in pain, like he's screaming, but I know he's not in pain. Like his paws are not being bent at a weird angle. Uh, I'm not squeezing too hard. What's happening is his back legs are getting tired, but more importantly, he's just mad at the situation. So he's crying out. Out. And then this woman who's watching all of this, oh, come on, let him down. I ignore it. He keeps, you'd have thought that he was like caught in a bear trap or something. He's being so dramatic. And she's like, okay, that's enough. Stop. So I let him down and he immediately jumps right back up. There is profound wisdom in this story. You must consider when the chips are down, what needs to be done is obvious. And that truth is not changed by how it may make people feel or by how people have been trained to gaslight you with various arguments by appealing to your sensibilities. Oh, but well, we need them if they have merit. You like merit, right? Merit's okay. If they have merit, that's fine, right? Please, my patriot in Christ, even when they have merit, like they come here legally, whatever that merit is, their lives are improving at the expense of opportunities which otherwise would have been given to a American kids who are more than qualified and who don't have unreliable scoring and applications, which are fake and like cheating mafias, like so many other of these uh, merit-based groups have, and they're merit-based until they accumulate political power, which they obviously will, and they use it to enforce DEI because that is what benefits them. We need to do what benefits us. Merit, fine on paper, great idea, but that's never how it actually works. That's what they tell you, get you to relax, then they work against you. They use that merit to benefit themselves, forward their ethnic interests and increase their power, the power of their ethnic lobbies to give themselves more power, more immigration, more grants, more benefits, more opportunities, all at the expense of normal American patriots, of naps. And we love naps. They need to go back, though. Being an American is not the right of the world. It is the right of Americans and their posterity. It's written at the top of our Constitution. You ever read it? Meaning the foundation of the whole thing. Here's what we're doing. Here's who it's for. It's for us. Sorry, kid, your parents screwed up. They broke the law. Write a novel about it. Time to get you home. Remigration, that is the defining political issue of the 21st century. That issue is going to define the rest of your life. What kind of neighborhood you live in, how expensive it is, what kind of jobs you can get, how much you're paid, how long you can stay there, how long you can stay anywhere without moving, your kids' development, their sense of identity and belonging and history, the quality of their education, what kind of life you can provide for them. Every, all of that is going to be informed by the success of remigration. By Nation 101, what's the first step? What's the first question? Who's supposed to be here? Who's not? Awesome, let's make a border. That's been the defining issue of the last 10 years thanks to Donald Trump, and that will be the defining issue of the rest of your life. All of their power comes from this. It is the issue, immigration and sovereignty. Immigration and sovereignty? Congratulations, kid. You got off cheap. You think the people whose flag is on the moon can't figure out how to send people back to the places where they simply walked over from in the first place? They're being bussed in, flown in. Okay, awesome. Yeah, run it back. Back. Turn it around. Go back. And you know what else? I haven't even told you the best part. The best part about undocumented immigrants is they can't even prove where they're supposed to go back to in the first place. Hey, congratulations. You're a Haitian now. I hear it's a beautiful place. Oh, you get to break our laws. You get to decide that you're an American. Hmm. Okay. Well, now we get to decide what you are after that. I got next. Yeah, that's called equality. And it's why our country was founded. Damn it. That's what we believe in over here. No, I was supposed to go to, to Santiago, not Santo Domingo. I don't understand what you're saying, senor. Take me back. Remain calm. We are reintroducing you to your natural habitat. That's not true. I'm being a silly guy. I'm just being a moderate. I'm being a moderate to entertain strangers on the internet. I'm being improvident. Relax. It's true. Most people will just leave. They will self-deport. You know, you cut off their ability to make money, to send money back home untaxed, to attach themselves to the teat of the American taxpayer. They'll leave. Or you could literally just pay them cash straight up to just go. And that would be cheaper than what it ends up costing for them to stay here in the long run. There are lots of ways to do this. Uh, again, moving people is the simplest issue to solve ever. Most people move every day. It's like, just go that way. Um, but it's better actually to not illustrate the specifics of what this would look like mechanically because it's going to be ugly. You know, the media is going to make it want to look like the most evil freaking thing ever. That's why J.D. Vance was smart to not get baited into the specifics of it like you saw recently uh, where the interviewer was like, what, are you going to be asking for people's papers? Just like trying to make it seem like the freaking Hollywood movies and it's like really freaking mean. Okay, whatever. I'm sure they would get everyone all riled up about it just like they did about the border and the freaking cages and separating, whatever. Eventually, the boy who cried wolf will come into effect. 
you know, when it comes down to it, like it starts with criminals, they're getting the coverage in these people, uh, just like this getting coverage with the kids in the cages. Eventually you will be surprised at how little Americans care about non-Americans when their economy starts improving and things just seem better. Everything just improves and it's affecting literally every issue and it has to be this way and it will be this way because we get to have our country. It's not theirs. They can't have it. And even for now, ignoring how this would make housing cheaper, insurance cheaper, traffic less of an issue, overcrowding less of an issue, crime and cleanliness cleanliness, less of any, all sorts of things. The bottom line is this, if they stay, they will permanently install leftists who will do everything that you claim to oppose and they will make you pay for it. We will be set back decades. We can't have that. You can't do it. So solution is vote for Donald J. Trump for the president. That's crazy. I was just on the bigger part of the screen. Now I'm in the little TV. What? How does that work? The magic of Hollywood. You should leave a thumbs up on this video because I know you liked it. You're here. There's no way you watched the entire video and you didn't like it. So you need to express that. You need to get over yourself. You're still, you're still listening to me say this. You could have clicked like. Do you think you're like getting one over on me by not clicking like, swallowing your pride and like just, you know, showing a little bit of gratitude? You kind of are. Kind of does perturb me a little bit. Um, so I don't know, man. This could be an exercise in humility. Leave the thumbs up. Also, leave a comment. Go ahead. Tell me if, if it is the case that you are still here because you are hate watching. That is fine. We love you too. We leave many in our wake. Uh, leave a comment telling me how much you don't like me, um, please. And then uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel so we can continue this, this misadventure of ours. And then you're also going to want to turn on notifications again to continue the misadventure. And go ahead and share the video with a friend, right? I mean, eventually we got to add more to this. It can't just be you and I doing this dance forever, whether it's you love me or you hate me. This parasocial relationship needs to be polyamorous. We need to have as many people as possible either loving me or hating me. So it's, it's you. I want you to share the video with a friend, okay? That's the only way we win this or lose this. Um, okay, uh, vote for, but re regardless of, you know, it's like in it's like in <laughs> it's like in Spider-Man 2 when uh, and by the way that's not like Marvel soy jack okay that is that, that doesn't count this is grandfathered into immunity from that because it's a Sam Raimi trilogy there are bigger things happening right now than me and you, okay? And that is that you need to uh, vote for President Trump. All right, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. May God bless you. You're doing a fantastic job and everybody loves you. We'll see you next time. 